Hello again and welcome. This is Michael Pizzola here welcoming you to this value capping video rant. And I'm going to answer a question today um, that many of you who are new to my work are asking, and that is, Michael, what is this value capping all about? I thought we were handicapping. Well, I'm going to explain that to you, and I'm going to look at one of the derby preps together. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I am the author of the best-selling handicapping magic, co-author of the classic Pace Makes the Race. I'm the creator of the original online racing form. I'm the publisher of what I think is the best online racing form today, the Post Time Daily 2.0, and uh, also publisher of Blackmagic Ultimate Handicapping Software. So what I wanted to do um, on this video rant is to spend a little time talking with you about the real essence of what value capping is and a little bit about what the core essential is. In other words, I'm going to present to you value capping in a nutshell. Okay, so here it is, value capping in a nutshell. Here's the bottom line. Bet horses that you like, number one. Number two, that the public shouldn't like because they perceive something wrong with them, a bad last race, for example. And let the bet make you. Now, in other words, when I say, people say, you know, Michael, you end your videos, let the bet make you. What does that mean? I mean, it's all very clever and zen-like and all of that. But in other words, you should have little doubt. And I'm not talking about doubt about whether your horse will win. Because the honest truth is we can never, ever know that. I remember a great National Lampoon cover when I was in, I was in university. Uh, and National Lampoon was, you know, the thing. They had a cover which caused a lot of controversy which was, buy this magazine. If you don't buy this magazine, we'll kill this dog. And they had a dog, and someone's holding a re revolver to his head. It was very funny and very kind of sick, but it made a lasting impression. I'll never forget this cover. Well, imagine, imagine if it said, if you don't pick the winner of this race, we'll kill the dog. And I think about my dogs. And I'm, you know, supposedly a thoroughbred uh, racing, handicapping expert and author and all of that. Yee, yee. If you threaten to take the life of one of my dogs if I didn't come up with the winner, how can you know for certain? The answer is you can't. But you can make good, judged, well judged rather, value investments. Okay? So it's not that you have any doubt over whether the horse will win like that, but whether the investment that you're looking at is worth the risk. Now, you can find horses that you like by software or otherwise. It really, you know, yes, the better you are at, you know, at finding, at ferreting out these uh, hidden gems, which is, uh, quite frankly, it's time consuming and tedious without software. But whether you use software or you don't, but if the horses are that you come up with, if you will, the horses that you like, are the same horses that the public should like. Like in that stakes race that we looked at last week. Yeah, sure, winner was right on top. and Who cares? It was a really short price. So if you've got that situation where the horses that you like are also, you know, the low morning lines and the public should like them, you've probably got a pass race on your hands. And by the way, the public does a pretty good job. So rather than say, well, the horses I like are the public, the, the horses the public like, hmm, I can't make money there, might as well look at some of these crummy horses. No, that's not what's meant by contrarian, because the public picks 33% winners year in and year out. Don't know how they do it, but they do, and that's just the reality. Now, it's a not a profit, it's not a profitable strategy just to bet the favorites. You'll get 33% winners or 32% winners. You're not going to make any money. You probably lose a little money, parenthetically, about the take. But it's not bad. Okay, So betting horses that the public shouldn't like is contrarian. 
Okay, it's against the flow. You know the old saying: if you you're doing um, the opposite of what the public does most of the time, most of the time, you're probably on the right path. But this doesn't mean that value capping is blindly contrarian. If it were, all we would have to do is look up at the board and it would not be called value capping, it would be called, that's a long shot, I'm gonna be contrarian. I'm gonna go against everyone. So no, it's not that. But if we can find a horse that we like, the public shouldn't, because maybe its form is masked by a bad last race or, um, Maybe uh, the last few numbers that it ran, you know, were at a wrong distance. And if you go back in its past performances, you can find very good numbers at today's distance. Something, some extras on the horse that, that are hidden from the public who are very much focused on the last race. If we can find that, like a horse coming to a race, you know, maybe its last few races, you know, it didn't finish so well, but it looks like it might be coming to a race. If you can find one of those, you might have a good value investment. Now, I want to talk for one more moment about the other part of the value capping equation. So we find a horse that we like, in other words, that has good things going for it, usually good numbers, okay, whatever numbers you use. I use very mm, well-crafted uh, pace numbers that I've developed over the last two and a half decades, almost three decades. Um, and they're in, they're in the Black Magic Ultimate Handicapper software, but you know, numbers are numbers. Of course, I think my numbers are the best, otherwise I wouldn't use them. I'd use whatever number I thought the best. That's, I'm, I'm about the results. But just as important is the other part, letting the bet make you. In other words, there should be, when you look at that, you just go and you know that this is a good, investment not that the horse will win all the time okay it's another way when i say let the bet make you it's another way of saying that there should be a felt sense just a a sense you know it when you have a sometimes you're at the races and you just you're looking maybe at the horses in the paddock or or just taking their warm-up and you just get a sense not body language none of that just Mm, you know, my numbers say the five, but my second number's on the seven. This seven. This, you don't know why. So that's what it is. There's a, there's a felt sense when you're looking at your work, whether you're doing with paper and pencil or you're using some, you know, software. Uh, but there's a sense, a felt sense of certainty. I had a Zen teacher who used to say, when you sit, sit. When you stand, stand. But above all, don't wobble. In other words, that uncertainty, hmm, should I bet, should I pass, should I bet, should I bet? No. It, once you do that, you've made your decision. You have to pass. It should be as clear and as just as beautifully clear as a, a Zen garden, okay? Where just there's all this stuff is very, you know, you know the issues in the race, and one or two things pop out. Okay. So if there are many questions in a race, many causes of doubt, those lead to doubt. Those are the doubts, if you will. Okay. For example, if you have many horses on layoffs or you have first-time starters in the race, more than, let's say, two of them. Okay. Now, th th those, are, those are obvious causes of doubt. And sometimes you'll just have, gee, I don't feel good about this race. I don't know why. You don't have to know why. All you have to know is that this computer, which is a billion times more powerful than these little boxes made of, you know, aluminum and plastic and glass um, that we sit in front of, uh, that, that this computer is giving you some feedback that mm, the bet is not making you. Now, I want to look at a concrete example, and I want to look at tomorrow's, uh, February 8th, 2014's Robert B. Lewis stakes at Santa Anita. It's a derby prep. Yes, they the winner only gets 10 derby points as opposed to, you know, some of the bigger preps that start next month, uh, get 50. And then, you know, as it goes on to the really big preps, the Santa Anita Derby, for example, and um, the Louisiana Derby, they get like 100 points. 
So this isn't a huge amount of points, but it makes this point really um, vividly uh, about horses um, that we like, about when they coincide with what the public should like. And also we look a little bit about doubts and question marks in the race. So come along with me. You'll look over my shoulder as I man the controls of Blackmagic Ultimate Handicapping Software. Okay, so here we are with Blackmagic Ultimate Handicapper Software open to tomorrow's Robert B. Lewis Stakes at Santa Anita. It's the eighth race at Santa Anita on February 8th, 2014. Now, I have this sorted by what the software's odds are. In other words, the horse that it likes best is going to have the lowest odds, right? So it's got the seven horse as two to one, the three horse is seven to two, the one horse is five to one, and so forth. And then there's a big red line. The other horses are really above random. I don't want to get into that now. It's a bit of a longer story, but not good, okay? Um, or not above random in the race. But there's an interesting thing. If you look over to the third uh, column of odds line, that's the morning line. Well, guess what? Seven to two, nine to five, two to one, they're the three morning line favorites. So there's a situation where the horses we like are the same horses that the public should like. And if you look at the middle column of contention, the horses should make those three. You see two to one, three to one, four to one. The horses, the public should make those three, um, not horses, but colts, uh, the morning line favorites. So we probably don't have very much in the race. If you want to look, I've made some notes here, H and A, and those are just my little abbreviations. Meaning that if you look at the seven horse, it's two for two. Uh, what could be wrong? Now, if this does go off as, as the third favorite, maybe it'll go off at a four to one or something. I don't really think so. Maybe I could justify having a bet on it. Uh, but it was an awfully hard race last time. Uh, you can't fault the three, Midnight Hawk. It's done nothing but win. Um, the one horse, you see that indication of one SL means first start after a layoff, has been off since the 14th of December. Yet Now, yes, it's been, um, you know, working out. Six, two six furlong workouts, two five furlong workouts. Gee, I don't know. And, it, and when you look at horses with hard races like the seven horse and uh, even the three horse to a certain degree, Remember that these are three-year-old colts, and they can withstand those kinds of hard finishes much better than an older horse. Uh, now we look at Cool Samurai, and here's an interesting horse, uh, even though it also had a little bit of a hard stretch, uh, stretch drive last time. Um, there is Home Run Kitten, another closer in the race. Now, here's where it's interesting. You notice I've written style there. This is, it's fascinating. Blackmagic makes this from a very sophisticated analysis of both position and velocity, thinks it, it will favor a horse toward the lead. In other words, that it's unpressured. If you look at the acupressure screen, this seven and the three, they look, they own both calls, especially the seven horse is way out in front, which leads me to think, hmm, this might be pretty good. If you come over here and look at the, uh, primary pace column, which is a second call velocity, it's got a big advantage. However, I I don't keep them. I don't have to keep them by myself anymore. The program keeps the track profiles. And just the recent last few weeks, if you look at the way the horses expend their energy, 51.6, 51.18, 50.63, 51.6, if this doesn't speak to you uh, don't worry, there's a long story about how they're calculated. The lower means the later, and the higher those numbers are means the earlier the horses are. Well, these are pretty late numbers. So we have a situation where the race positionally and from looking at the position of velocity favors an early horse, but the track favors the later horses like the four or the five. So I've got a situation where the horses I like or the horses my software likes are the same horses that the public likes. And I've got this more doubt, you know, layoff, hard races, more doubt that the horses that fit the track profile don't have very good numbers. So 
it's a bit of a mess. Now, I imagine that if the seven went off at a decent mid price, four to one, nine to two, it might be worth a shot, even though it's against the profile. Um, so that's what I mean by looking at whether you're agreeing with the public or if you have some doubt. And in this case, I've got both. So that's why you'll see professionals pass a lot of races. Not because like we don't like betting. I mean, of course, you know, you have to get the money through the windows, right? If you want a return on investment, so you can't sit on your hands all day, but you have to wait for the right situation. There's a race tomorrow night at Penn National as a contrast. And I haven't looked carefully at this. I don't know what the weather is going to be like. For those of you in the Midwest and the East Coast going through these just ghastly storms. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't even know if Penn National will be running tomorrow. But if it does in the eighth race, there's this horse on top, the five horse called I'm Not Mad, I'm Even. Seven to two on the odds line, 15 to one on the contention. I mean, the public should not like him. We like him, the public doesn't. That's what we want. 10 to one on the morning line. And if you look down, um, he finished 21 and a half lengths last time. So the public will probably dismiss this, this filly. However, if I were to make a case, today's race is 5,000 non-winners two lifetime. That last race was 7,500 non-winners two lifetime. The race before, she finished second at this level, so it had a good finish, then ran up the track. Now it's dropping back down. Hmm. Public's they're going to be stuck in that 21 lengths. And perhaps, uh, I believe, Strunk Miklos, uh, the E stands for Erica, Elaine. It's an E, an e female name. Uh, but, you know, maybe they have this little thing about, well, she's only two for 21 this year and uh, so forth and so on. But that 21 lengths behind, they won't quite see that it dropped to five, went up to seven, 75, dropped to five. So without looking at anything more, I've got a horse I like that the public shouldn't, and I see the reason why they shouldn't bet him. This is the kind of race that I prefer. Now, again, I don't know what the scratches are, I don't know the weather conditions and all, but just wanted to give you an idea of the dynamic and give you a couple examples. One, a derby prep. One, a kind of bottom of the barrel, <laughs> late at night, evening track, $5,000 claimer that I'd like to take more out of the race than it would cost to buy one of these noble fillies um, that are more of a potential value investment. So don't get so caught up on the big name races. Very often, there aren't good investments there. But if you look around and if you have a tool, a software tool like Blackmagic, something that allows you to uh, look at many, many races like tomorrow in Las Vegas, I have 165 races and a lot of portfolios to go through that will uh, help me to narrow down my focus and to really focus in on the best of the value investments. But I hope you get the idea that you need to be patient. Wait until, as Talbot, Ray Talbot would say, everything is right and the price is right as well. Or as I like to say, find a horse that you like, find horses you like that the public shouldn't and let the bet make you. So I hope that clears up why I'm always saying what I'm about to say, which is thank you very much for joining me for this value capping video rant. Don't forget to enjoy, take care, and let the bet make you. I'll see you next time. <music>